Hello, welcome back to the episode of Stories of Horror. Another episode we dive into the mysteries and the unknowns of the world. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Without further ado, hit the intro. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Stories of Horror. This is episode 19, and we dive into the story of Dean Coral, the Candyman. Um, this episode is informative, you know, just letting you guys know that there's a lot of craziness, a lot of people who are living some crazy lives and who are monsters living around you, so be safe and be aware. But this story right here is very horrific. This story right here is very crazy. It happened here in Texas, in Houston, Texas, and it's a story that some people may know, some people may have not heard of and stuff, but we're gonna dive into some of that and some of those horrific um, things that occurred and um, dive into some of the stuff that happened or led up to some of the stuff occurring. So without further ado, let's get into it. Dean Coral was born in 1939 in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Dean Coral's childhood wasn't the best since his parents split when he was young, they got divorced, but there wasn't anything crazy that happened early on to him to lead him down this path. His mother was settled in Vendor, Texas, where she met and married a salesman. In school, Dean Coral was a good student and didn't do anything crazy or strange or out of the ordinary. Dean Coral's stepfather started a candy company where Dean would work growing up. After his mother divorced her second husband, she would start a revamped candy company in Houston, Texas, and she named Dean the vice president of that company. So from the first like stuff of the story, you don't really see anything crazy or out of the ordinary. Everything seems like cool, and you really like sometimes you see like some of these stories about some of these people who become like serial killers or who become like you know psychotic or crazy or something like that. You see some things that happen that the childhood and stuff. You know, childhood trauma can carry on with you through like life and stuff like that, but. You really didn't see anything out of the ordinary. All thing you seen was that um his mom got divorced. I think she was I think it was two times, three times in total, something like that. They got divorced, but you didn't really see anything crazy out of the ordinary. He became the vice president of the candy company. He was working there like that, and he was just helping his family out and stuff, and being a provider for his family and helping and stuff. You didn't really see anything crazy, but I don't know what exactly led to him becoming what he became like that. But we're gonna keep reading to the story and get to it. Dean got drafted into the U.S. Army in 1964 for the Vietnam War. He served almost a year in the army. He got discharged after explaining he had to help his mother at the candy shop company. Again, the story seems very, you know, innocent, like it's like a regular upbringing. Now, I don't know if anything happened in the military when he was drafted there. I know he left early, so he had to help his mom with the company thing. I don't know if something happened or occurred there that kind of led him, because we don't really get too much details about his time in the military. He was only spent like, a couple months there, and it was for the Vietnam War, so we didn't really see. I don't know, something that he, stuff, stuff that he saw kind of made him into like a murderer, but I don't know what led to him being a pedophile and him being like fascinated with underage boys and stuff. I don't know what led to that. I don't know what was drawn to that because I know in Vietnam it was in, it was, it was probably in different spots, different part of the world. I don't know what happened or what occurred and stuff. So I don't know if that triggered something in him or caused him to do something, but everything so far in the story just seems normal, but a crazy twist comes, you know, now. Early on, there was a lot of warning signs that Dean was interested in underage boys. It was said that one teenage boy made a complaint to Dean's mother that Coral had made sexual advances towards him. Dean's mother fired the teenage boy after that complaint. Now, this um, information right here was said in the book called The Man with Candy, the book written about him, written about his story like that, um, something like that is focusing on him and stuff. Uh, I feel like the mother did a poor job, did a poor job in that. If um, the warning signs like that, if the kids came up, a complaint, she should have took the signs and seeing all the young boys hanging around at the candy shop and one boy made a complaint and stuff like that. And you see him very close with the boys. Not saying everybody's like that, of course, but 
she probably, she probably want to think her son was like that, but if she would have just at least investigated, you know, at least investigate the early signs, you know, my, you might say initially, I don't think that's, that was, he would do something like that, but you might go investigate, you might see and say, you know what, let me go check it out just in case, just in case and just to make sure like that. And she didn't investigate. She just thought the boy was lying or something. So she fired the boy and she could, she probably, if she could have maybe like solved it or try to investigate then, maybe some things would have changed. Maybe could have got, um, swerved something else like that. Could have got some help early on, but now you know of course later now like it kind of backfired a little bit i don't know what the mother did when she found out i don't know if she died before she he found like she found out that he was doing what he did and stuff like that i didn't really read anything about that when i was on um, researching him and stuff but yeah that was crazy that the thing that the mother didn't investigate or do anything to see um why the boy made the complaint at all but let's get to the next parts of the story a lot of teenage boys seem to be brought to the candy shop some as customers some as employees and some as runaways. Dean also built close relationships with them. It was also said that Dean was very flirtatious with the young boys, including one boy named David Brooks, who was sexually abused by Dean on a regular basis. Dean bribed him with gifts and money for his silence. Now, David, I know he was around Dean for a while. He was around him since, since he was like 12 or 13, and he said that he was um, getting sexually abused by him and in a relationship with him, close relationship with him for a long time and stuff. And then he decided to help, um, help Dean out like that. And he made a bad decision. Now he was still old enough to know, you know, like the consequences of those decisions. So like that's why he kind of got faced, that's why he faced um, some charges in the, in the future when they um, turned themselves in like that. But it's kind of um, just a little weird like that he never like got any help and like that. I know he was at a young age, so you can look at it kind of both ways. You can say, well, at that age, you should still know right from wrong. You have, if you have a conscience, you should know what's right, what's wrong. But he also, you also, you also can say that you know maybe he was young, he got manipulated, he got fooled into some of this stuff like that because he was very young and Dean was with them since he was 13 and up, so like that. So it can, you can look at it kind of both ways, but. Either way you look at it, it's still a horrible decision that he made to help Dean out. It was reported in 1970 in September, Coral killed his first victim. And after his mother would get divorced for a third time, she would move to Colorado, but Dean would stay in Texas and start a career as an electrician. During Dean's criminal acts, he moved from and to a lot of places, never staying longer than a week in a certain spot. A few months after Dean killed his first victim, he would abduct two teenage boys and tie them up and sexually assault them. David Brooks caught Dean in the act, and Dean lied and said that he was a part of a gay pornography ring and that these teens were headed to California when they were done. He later admitted to killing them, and he bribed David again by buying him a Corvette and offering him $200 to every boy David could bring to him, and David agreed. Now, Elmer was one of the worst accomplices. They all did bad things, but Elmer was one of the worst ones because he actually enjoyed doing this stuff as well, too. Like that, he actually helped on a lot of the murders that Dean did and stuff like that. He had the knack. He, he said it was first, it was for like just getting money for his family, financial issues, but then when he didn't get paid the amount that Dean promised him to get paid, he still continued to do the acts. He still enjoyed to continue to do the stuff like that. And it's kind of like the, the saying, you know, the love of money is root of all evil. We've seen people do a lot of stuff for the love of money. We've seen people kill on um, somebody. Remember that one dude on that one show that was a show called The Sweet Pie Show? He tried, to, he tried to hire somebody to kill his own mother for money like that. So we've seen people do some crazy stuff for the love of money like that. They do a lot of crazy stuff. You, you can, of course, you need money in this world to survive and do stuff, but when you love money, you put money above life and stuff like that, it kind of leads you down a dark path. And we've seen another person live down a dark path and did some horrendous and horrible things and horrible acts. Now let's get to the next part of this terrible story. Dean would later get another accomplice, and that was Elmer Henley, who Dean decided not to kill. He offered him the same deal as David. It was said that Elmer said he only took the offer because of his family financial hardships, but later, even after getting paid a less amount than what was told, he still stood around to help Dean with those horrific acts. The two would use candy, alcohol, or drugs to lure young boys ranging from 13 to 20. After abducted, Dean and his two accomplices would bring them to his house, tie them up, and sometimes it is said that Dean made them write letters back to their families to make it seem like they were okay. Each victim would be tied and strapped to a wooden board of torture where they would be brutally raped and then killed 
by getting strangled to death or shot fatally. See, the story is just um, sickening. It's um, terrible. Them luring people in, luring there's some runaway kids, maybe it's like in the old days, a lot of runaway kids and hitchhikers and stuff, luring them in and then torturing them and then just like, you know, just like then killing them and burying their bodies off and and then forcing them to write letters and send back to the family like that and kind of like make it seem like they everything's okay they just need some time away and stuff like that. That's kind of, that's like there's just very crazy and very sickening like that. The story is very terrible, a very um horrendous acts that happened and stuff like that, but yeah, but you, you know, they, they, they all, they all they already got charged life in prison because they all was buying to it. You guys did all that. You did all the steps leading up to it. You helped lure people in. You was a part of all the, like, the whatever type of group thing they had. He was helping. And then Elmer case, he was killing people. David um, swear that he didn't kill anybody. He said he was just luring them in. But in, it's like, like that thing, a saying they have, I think it's in the Bible, too. Uh, they're saying, like, when you, like, see a sin or see something a uh, crime committed and you don't say anything you basically kind of do you kind of a part of it as well because you like seeing something and you're not stepping in and saying anything or you're not like is doing anything like that like you ain't gotta like go over there and be superman or batman and try to stop the crime but you like you you still allowing it to happen uh, you see like a man murdering people every day on your street like ah oh, he killed another person and you're just sitting there and letting it happen you didn't call the police or do anything like that you're kind of part of it as well like that because you're just letting it happen and i feel like um david i don't know if he killed anybody now he got charged with one counts of murder they charged him with one of those like that i don't know if they just put him on put it on him i don't know if he killed anybody or not like that he was already caught so he could just tell the truth he get in life in prison anyway like that so i don't know that happened but you still allowed it to happen and you still uh, like helped out and did some things like that so it made you look even bad too, like that. Even that's worse as um the other people that look doing the acts too, like that. But let's move on to the next part of the story. Parents also got little to no help about the whereabouts of their children. Law enforcement did a horrible job in locating or even investigating all the suddenly missing people in the area. Another count of bad law enforcement back in the old days. Remember on some of these stories of horrors. Remember the Zodiac Killer one we did. Um, what's what, what else we did? We did another one. We did something on Ed Gein, um, and then it was something else. Zodiac Killer Ed Gein or Ed Gein, whatever you pronounce his name. It was something else too. I forgot which one it was too. But like every time, it's the same reoccurring thing. Like the police uh, officer, or the law enforcement in the old days did a bad job investigating, investigating, and they was fooled and manipulated easily. I think easily, like very easily. We see Jeffrey Dahmer's story, you know, like how he manipulated the police. Ted Bundy and them take it take forever to uh, catch them. Charles Manson, it, like it just made things. They, they, like it took them forever to catch people, or sometimes they didn't catch the person. The person just died off. Remember the Golden State Killer? He was about 80 years old when they called him like that. He had like a lot of stuff. He had like 20 plus murders. He had 40 plus rape um, charges and all types of stuff, kidnapping and stuff. It took them forever to catch him like that. So law enforcement in the old days, law enforcement now of course is better. They have better technology and stuff like that. Of course, it's still got a long way to go from being good like that. Nothing can be perfect, but at least being close to perfect. But in the old days, they really didn't have, they really didn't do too much like that in the old days. And about you see some of these crimes that would happen in the old days and how they, like, they never really found the people or got that. The chief of police also got, um, he got voted out of office because like he did a terrible job and um, investigating and doing some stuff and the public voted him out of office because it was like calling in it's like my kid is missing or this person right here is missing my son is missing my brother is missing or whoever it was to you was missing like that and they did a bad job investigating around the area and it took the people who did the stuff to turn themselves in for them to actually find the victim's bodies and give the, the um, family some type of closure if a child was dead like that and just not knowing like because sometimes when you don't know I did not, not like knowing like they dead or not. You might speculate that they might have died, but if you don't know if they're like dead or not like that or missing or something, you kind of like still like stuck up in like limbo like that and it can like stretch you out. So, but it, it took the people who actually did the crimes to turn themselves in for them to actually see who actually did it. So that's how bad the law enforcement was back in that day. But let's move on to the, the ending part of the story. The end of Dean Coral came back in 1973 when he was murdered by Henley, one of his accomplices. Dean was angry that Henley brought a girl back to him and he threatened to kill Henley for that. Henley pleaded and got out of the situation, but when Dean guard was let down, Henley shot him six times, which killed him. Henley would later turn himself in to the police and both him and David would let law enforcement know where the bodies of the victims was buried. The two of them would be sentenced to life in prison. David faced one murder and Henley faced six counts of murders. 
And that is the ending of the story of the Candyman. And it's a terrible story. Horrific story. 28 victims. There's actually more than 28 victims. You look at it because the people who lost family members are basically victims too. Like that. So it's, it's a lot of, you know, like, just bad, tasteless stuff like that happened like that. It was just terrible uh, event and stuff. And Dean Coral was a very evil man like that. An evil man. So hopefully from this story or from this stuff that happened in the past, you guys be a little more safe in life. You guys go around and be cautious. And, you know, call your family members, call your friends, and, and, you know, make sure they are protected and stuff like that. Because you never know what might be lurking. You know, where there's good, there's evil. There's always the opposite to everything in life. You know, good, evil, light, dark, and et cetera, like that. So you're going to see a lot of that type of things in the world like that. No, no, Nobody would ever agree upon the same thing either in the world. So you might see a lot of people say this, but you never see, you'll see some people say that too. Like, you're never going to see somebody agree upon one thing. So you're never going to be one sided thing either. Not everybody going to believe that the laws that are made, like saying, like, I should not kill people like that. You shouldn't kill or murder anybody. Some people may think you probably should do it because you have free will to do it. So it's always going to be some type of opposite. So just make sure you stay safe. But this story here is very terrible and very horrific. But this is the end of the video. Um, I hope you guys learned something from this video. I hope you guys, um, I wouldn't say enjoyed this video because it's some bad stuff like that. But watch this video and stuff. But next episode, we're going to dive into trying to see exactly what it would be. Might be something of a mysterious creature or something like that. Like that. I'll give you guys a hint. It's a mysterious creature. A mysterious creature on land that has been known throughout history that people have been trying to find or discover. Like that. We're going to dive into that um, next story. But I'll see you guys next time on the channel. Peace out.